Today we conclude the season of Epiphany, this season of awakening and opening. And then the church year moves on its way to the unavoidable and unmistakable road of Lent this week, the time of repentance and renewal. And so here we are on that change. Here we are on the mountain with Jesus and the disciples, and I want to challenge us, us today to be open to the full story, this divine way with Jesus. And I'll start with an admission. In my youth, in my teenage years, I was zealous for the Lord. Any zealous youth out there? Okay. No, come on. You were zealous too, right? Didn't you go to Luther League and all that stuff? Okay. Well, in my youth group, I would play guitar and uh, lead some Bible studies, and we'd pray before we went to school together, and I wanted, yep, you, and I thought, I'm going to be the next pastor of my church, Irving Bible Church, um, and so, so much so that in the later 90s, when we were all getting our first email addresses, my first email at hotmail.com was next door to Paul. And it was kind of like saying, man, Sean's going to live so holy that if you're trying to send him something in the mail, you better send it next door to the Apostle Paul, because that's where my mansion is, Paul and Sean. <laughs> yes, I told you, very zealous and very naive, and I'm ashamed. But for, for my high school years, it was next to Paul at Hotmail.com. Also, just side note, I've lost access to it. If anyone can help me with Microsoft... Uh, I can't get in to my 1996 email anymore. I would love to see the love letters I was writing back and forth. Well, I didn't know a theology of the cross. I only knew, hey, be zealous, read the New Testament, and then live that way, and you'll get a mansion with the saints. And now I've been around Lutherans, and I've learned another way. It's okay to want things and long for things. I was thinking of a man who does this with Jesus, and it's beautiful. The last miracle that Jesus does in the Gospel of Mark when he's on his way to Jerusalem, where he will give his life, they go through Jericho, and there's a man there who cries out the Kyrie that Riley led today. Christe eleison, son of man, have mercy on me. And it's Bartimaeus. And Jesus hears this man and says, call that guy over. And then Jesus asks, what do you want me to do for you? Which is just a beautiful phrase. I love that Jesus said that to someone. What do you, what do you want me to do for you? He says, I want to recover my sight. Jesus says, go on your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately... Bartimaeus recovered his sight. Jesus had told him, go on your way. But guess which way Bartimaeus goes. It says that he turns and follows Jesus into Jerusalem. And there's the juxtaposition I'm contemplating today. A God, a Savior, a spirit of compassion that says to us, I'm here with you. What do you want me to do for you? And if you follow this Jesus, well, he's not headed back to Galilee to retire on the sea, sailing his boat across the sea. He's headed to the world's place of power and to give his life there. So Transfiguration Sunday is always before Lent, and we feel this juxtaposition. It's later in the gospel. We're in chapter 9 now. But it wouldn't work to do this story during Lent because we're focused on repentance. And so we always get this story before we head into Lent. You could consider that we go up to the mountain and we have this miraculous experience and this announcement. And then it's back down from the mountain to the valley to wilderness and next week temptation and on Wednesday, the truth of our need with the ashes. We go through that until Easter. It's white and gold now. It'll be white and gold again on Easter. And there's another context to the story today. 
It's where Jesus has just come from. He has just come from telling the disciples, and it says teaching them, that he will suffer, even suffer death, and after three days rise again. I think you know the story. The disciples, especially Peter, they find this unbelievable. And remember, Peter says, surely not, Lord. And then Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. Well, the story is now six days later, after that bizarre teaching, Jesus is transfigured, dazzling and glorious on the mountain with even Moses and Elijah in conversation. So I don't blame the disciples for being terrified and confused, which they are, because are these mixed messages or what? You have to suffer and die, but then I see you with the prophets and the law shining in glory? The answer is yes, and welcome to it. This divine way with Jesus. It isn't the first time that it seemed complicated or mysterious in the story, and it won't be the last. I have another example that comes from a book I find really interesting. In grad school, I got an assigned reading about a certain philosopher's teaching. And a scholar was going to write the book about this philosopher. And this philosopher is difficult to understand because he meanders and he's provocative. But the writer says, I'm going to ask his permission to do a book where I explain some of the themes and rhythms of his major writings. And so Jeffrey Bennington does. He gets permission to write a kind of systematized version of this prolific thinker. But the philosopher tells him, I'll only give you my blessing for this general book you want to make if, under one condition, you get two-thirds of every page, and on every page I get the bottom third where I am going to write something new and provocative, and I might even question the exact thing that you're saying above me on the page, and that's how you can get this book done. Does that make sense on every page? And then he says, Jeffrey, once you've written your work about the themes and rhythms of my work, and then I insert my writing underneath yours, there will be no edits or changes. What's done is done. Well, Jeffrey agrees because it's the only way this book will get written. And so it happens. There's a text about a somewhat clear way to understand the story of this philosopher. But then that philosopher on every page is also telling a story that brings up questions or pokes holes or just dialogues with the text above it or even says things like, in my earlier writings you've heard me say, but I no longer believe that. That is the way I'm holding this complicated story of transfiguration today. Here is this glorious scene, dazzling white, the voice of God in this holy moment. Isn't it this the kingdom of God on this mountain? And isn't this God's prince and king? And there is only one way to get there. There is only one way to encounter the transcendence of God. And it is that that king on a mountain is the same one that will suffer crucifixion and die his friends will all go away to mock him they will write king of the Jews above him on the cross but he goes there to die this king and so it's like reading a book about a king where the top section is here are all the successes and here is the high story of ministry but on every page there is also the king himself saying it was for suffering's sake. It was for the sake of love. There is no other way other than death. Nothing less than the opposite of shining on a mountain. I can tell you about suffering and darkness and the valley of the shadow of death. 
It's both stories. This mystery of Christ is we say of both stories. Surely God is in this place. Holy ground. The philosopher in the book by Jeffrey Bennington is Jacques Derrida. He's the one that writes on the bottom of every page. He's famous for deconstruction. He's famous for taking systems of thought and writing and looking and saying, ah, but the system has some holes. The system needs to consider something new. And he always even means himself. So he means that writing and thought, they convey truth and experience, but at the very same time, they have to remain open and humble and admitting that there's more. And as we celebrate transfiguration today, I think we are invited to hear Jesus himself keep telling us, yes, and there's more. The kingdom of God is not just this glory on a mountain. It is not, Sean, necessarily next door to Paul. If you take the mountain and you solidify that moment and that event as the ultimate story, you're no longer telling the story of Jesus, who is saying to the disciples, tell no one what you've seen, come down the mountain with me. So friends, I need to tell you, I probably have been priced out of Paul's zip code anyway. <laughs> and I've learned that over time. I've also learned the sacramental rhythm of daily trying to remember our dying and rising with Christ. And that humble experience will change your life. Maybe today I want to be more like Bartimaeus. I want to tell Jesus what I want and what I need. And then I want to be in the community that follows his sacrificial way. And you can too. We go there together this Wednesday, remembering we are dust. And as we go, we can rest that Christ fulfills it all. I can admit the depth of my need because Christ fulfills my need. And it's his promise that we keep urging each other to remember. We will see two things on the page in our worship in many times, but we'll see it at communion too. We will sing holy, holy, holy. That is us on the mountain, like we're on Mount Hermon with Jesus surrounded in glory. And then we'll say the simple words that we pass around to each other on bended knee, giving it right around. And so you can say the story of glory is busted open by the suffering servant, and that's who we follow. Peter, James, John, Paul, Bartimaeus, you and me. We follow Jesus. We listen to Jesus who says, remember me. Not by some grand statue on the mountain, but by holding out bread to each other. Take and eat. This is God having come down the mountain. This is the body of Christ for you.